And our third speaker is Mike Brigham. Am I right in that? Brigham? Yes. And Mike comes from the solar industry and will be able to tell us in one way some of the alternatives. I mean, sometimes you get so hung up on the whole fossil fuel uh, conundrum that we forget that uh, that's the problem that we're wrestling with, but we also need to think about, well, what are the other opportunities? And uh, that's been almost difficult from day one. I'm bored or silly with all the conversations we've had, especially in my public life, about alternatives or renewables and how that could some, certainly in some ways take over. But I think we'll hear something very specific in terms of Mike's own experience with solar energy. Mike. Um, first of all, uh, saying I'm from the solar industry, I actually fell into this by accident. Uh, I actually had a renewable energy cooperative that developed solar systems. I'm going to explain that today. Uh, I have my own business totally outside the industry. I'm a volunteer that does this because I'm so passionate about it. Greening Sacred Spaces has such a, such a, a, a close and tight focus with what my organization is trying to undertake. Um, I, I felt very, very pleased to be asked to present here today. You know, we just can't keep living the way we are with the, the resource consumption, the, the pollution, the greenhouse gas emissions. I don't think that's news to anyone. Is that not loud enough? There, all right. Um, and the, the, there are various barriers to the change, but I, I wanted to basically tell you today why that is possible and what's being done to attempt the change. An interesting um, story was that at a renewable energy conference that I was at, one of the keynote addresses was from an Aboriginal leader, and he said, we don't own land. We are the, the caretakers of land for future generations. We should be passing it on to them as we got it. And I think you know, that has semi-religious overtones as well, but the point is, we don't deserve to be able to pass on a wrecked environment. If we didn't get it that bad and it wasn't perfect, we don't deserve to pass it on that way. I think there's a moral imperative that's emerging more and more clearly to move on to a better way of doing things, and I'm here to describe a little bit about that today. When any of us, you know, flick on a light switch or plug, on, plug in the toaster, we just know the electricity is going to be there. We don't give a lot of thought as to sort of where it comes from or the environmental impacts that happen as a result. Depending on the energy source, and there are multiple sources, there are very different impacts. To show you that changes to the positive are very possible, um, a very unsung um, success, a huge success in Ontario, was the fact that this is the year that Ontario is officially out of coal-fired generation. Now, it's been in the news, but yes, <laughs> coal is among the cheapest ways to generate electricity if you just look at the generation source. When you look at the health impacts and the environmental impacts, suddenly it's a very different story. Some Three people in 1997 said, you know what, this just isn't right, we just can't keep doing this. Started speaking to some others, uh, spoke to the Ontario Medical Association, and they said, yeah, we're aware of how many asthma, how many premature deaths, how many hospital visits this is creating. Yeah, we really should change this. And today, with the coal phase out, it is the largest greenhouse gas emission reduction in North America. It is equivalent to taking seven million cars off the road every year. Wow. So this is a fantastic thing. So the point is, social change can create the desired changes that we're looking for. The Ontario is at a crossroads right now. Our generation infrastructure and our grid infrastructure are all equivalent to the analogy I draw as a, it's an old car. It's 12 years old, it's been running okay, uh, you don't know how much longer it's going to run without repairs, it needs a new engine, it needs a transmission. You've got to get a new one pretty soon. Well, the point is, if you do get a new one, it'll be more efficient, it'll be safer, it'll be cleaner, it'll be better, but you know, you've forgotten about, you know, having to make the payments, the car payments you made, they ended years ago. And you're now suddenly entering a time when suddenly you're going to be into new car payments, and you know, this is going to cost a lot. Well, it is going to cost a lot, and that's the situation that we're at in Ontario. You're hearing a lot of other reasons as to why the costs are very high, and there are some valid points that are being made. But the point is, we have to spend money no matter what we do. The question is, what are we going to spend it on? Today, as I see it, the question really comes down to, are we going to go more toward 
renewable sources or more toward primarily gas and nuclear. Let's do a little bit of the scorecard here. Um, in rating the three against each other, let's look at greenhouse gas emissions. You're probably surprised to see a, a cross by nuclear. Everybody, you know, you've heard nuclear is, you know, clean, safe, clean, safe, and economical. There are no greenhouse gas emissions at the nuclear facility, but uranium doesn't by itself. You have to move tons of earth to get small amounts of uranium. That takes fossil fuels. The refinement of it also takes a little bit of energy. The transportation takes some as well. So it's not entirely clean. Gas is good if you have to burn a fossil fuel, um, but it's not perfect either. Solar, of course, gets a gets a really a, you know an A. It takes about one year's worth of energy from a module to manufacture it. After that, it is it just goes for decades and decades without any emissions whatsoever. Uh, obtaining the fuel uh, here again, nuclear. You know you have to do all that that mining of the earth. Uh, natural gas. Um, a lot of people haven't read it yet, but uh, some recent studies coming out of the U.S. are talking about the fact that natural gas uh, delivery systems are leaking about 2% of that gas all the time. Natural gas is methane, is its active ingredient, and methane is a terribly potent greenhouse gas. And it's just coming out of the ground new leakage. It's, it's something that has to be maintained infrastructure-wise, so it's not really as clean as you would hope at the, just at, with the burning of it. Um, during the generation, uh, nuclear emits uh, items such as tritium, tritium in water. Uh, there's no safe amount for humans to take in, and it is leaking into our great lakes at times. Uh, natural gas, of course, does produce greenhouse gases. Uh, no construction costs. Uh, there's never been a nuclear facility in Canada, uh, in North America, built on time or on budget. Our history in Ontario is that they typically run 80% over, over budget. Uh, natural gas, generally they can predict solar, we're doing it all in fixed price contracts. Uh, the decommissioning costs is a big question for nuclear, it's all contaminated waste, how do you store it, how do you store it safely, where, how long, it's an emerging question. Uh, natural gas, not a big deal, solar, not a big deal. Solar systems should last somewhere between uh, 30 and 50 years, they don't have a known life at this point, it's, it's a long time. Easily dismantled uh, items, easily recycled. Uh, potential for catastrophic event. Um, nuclear, I think we've seen Chernobyl, we've seen Fukushima, we've seen Three Mile Island. These things were not supposed to happen. When things go wrong, they go very, very wrong. And it may be a small risk, uh, but even that risk is now being, uh, is now being seen to be higher than, than previously thought. Um, flexible, does it match, does the type of generation uh, match our grid needs? I will show a graph in a minute about our daily flow. We consume much higher amounts during the day than we do at night. On a hot summer day, the peak is in the afternoon because of air conditioning. It's a different curve in the winter. Uh, solar produces only during the day and only during that peak time. It doesn't get full marks because if the sun is out or there's snow in the modules, it doesn't produce. So it's not 100%. It produces energy close to where it's needed. Um, nuclear, no. You know, the further away, the better. Uh, natural gas. <laughs> natural gas, sort of question mark. We have the Portland's Energy Center down here, which went in okay. If you ask people in Oakville and Mississauga about whether they want a natural gas plant, you might have read about that in the newspaper. <laughs> did not go so well. Solar, I, I've got it on my roof. Uh, there's a system that's going to be going on the roof here. Um, if you walk past my house, you probably wouldn't even notice that they're there. We generate more power than we consume in a year. Um, it's totally benign. Uh, I didn't, by the way, get into cost, um, specifically because I'm going to talk about cost trends. Um, not so much about costs because I could pull out numbers, you know, from the internet or in public to, or to, to prove just about any point I wanted to make. They're all over the map, and so I didn't want to spoon feed you what I think the numbers are, but um, the numbers are very hard to determine in the cases of, uh, of nuclear in particular. In solar, in the time that I've been involved in, it has dropped it from $75 a watt to $0.72 cents a watt. That's a 99% increase. And if you think that's stopping, just since 2008, since we've been investigating and pricing systems to build, it has dropped by half. And what we're getting paid from the year that we started generating under the feed-in tariff program in Ontario to what we're going to get paid next year, it's in half. And that was intended. And that's going to continue. So solar is dropping down amazingly. You'll also hear comparisons about, oh, here's the cost of solar, but our average cost of electricity is so much less. Well, yeah, except Electricity costs different amounts depending on the time of day that it's generated because when we need more of it, we draw more electricity from sources that are more expensive. 
you start off with what's cheap or what's a, a flat line generation like nuclear, and then you start to add on more and more expensive items. Solar only produces at the peak times when electricity, otherwise on the grid, is at its most its highest expense. The brown section of this, it's a little larger color that's brown, is sort of a, an average daily summer demand curve. That's how much the grid needs. The yellow shows what solar, the pattern of solar producing. And you can see how it's almost identically, it's almost perfectly matched to the requirements of the grid. Also, when there is the peak load, typically it's the hottest sunny days, that's when solar is pumping out at its best. So it's very, very well suited. So comparing the average price of electricity to the price from solar, you are talking apples and oranges. Solar doesn't generate at night, and it doesn't do much in, in the morning and the evening. It generates when electricity is already expensive. I'm here to tell you about an organization that's trying to promote uh, solar energy and, and do it uh, in Ontario in a very aggressive way. We are a co-op that was founded in 2010. Um, I've been working on development of it actually since 2007. We are a not-for-profit group. We're operated partly by staff and partly by volunteers, such as myself. Um, we have 600, over 600 members now, and the solar bonds we've sold publicly, we've raised over three and a half million dollars. We have, uh, it's actually 22 projects as of today on Monday afternoon, it's going to be 23 projects. Uh, this is our group, it's a, it's a particularly good looking guy, just left the center, I was gonna say it's a nice looking group. And uh, second, second from right in the front row is a lady who will be downstairs to leave she, She's also okay. <laughs> Our mission is not to make money. Our mission is to, to grow renewable energy generation in Ontario by engaging citizens. And that's key, engaging citizens in projects that offer tangible results in three fronts. Financial, social, and environmental. This is what you might hear referred to as the triple bottom line. What do we do? We typically find large commercial rooftops. Um, we say to the roof owner, how would you like to lease us your roof for 20 years? We offer anywhere between 15 and $80,000 per year, every year for 20 years. Most of them like that idea. <coughs> the roof was just an expense before. If we can come to agreements on it, and it's structurally sound enough, and we can connect to the grid, we build a system. These are quite often multi-million dollar systems. We'll be spending up to 2.6 million per this year on our bigger ones. And then once the system is built, we sell solar bonds, such as we're doing downstairs. I'll tell you more about the bonds in a minute. And we then funnel that money into repeating the cycle again. And that's very simply it. Yeah. We take ugly roofs like this and beautify them so that they look ah, like this. I'm just going to pause there for a minute, let you take in the beauty of that. <laughs> I may be biased, but I think it's gorgeous. Uh, this project right now, we started out as in the upper left with uh, 15 uh, small projects, $100,000 each, trackers. Um, we then graduated into rooftops. We now have systems operating in, uh, in uh, Mississauga, St. Catharines, Ottawa, Toronto, uh, Moose Creek, which is southeast of Ottawa, uh, and the one on Monday going live is uh, in a small town just east, uh, southeast of uh, Goderich. Uh, we have a very aggressive build plan this year. We're going to be spending over $18 million developing 12 sites, all close to the GTA, Hale, York, Toronto. We have contract offers to build all of these, and we're just ramping up right now. What our bonds are, are our community solar bonds that are available to any resident of Ontario. Uh, they are $1,000 minimum, up to whatever you want to pay, and uh, we have people who are in the $150,000 to $200,000 range. Um, they're 5% five, five annual return, two payments per year, uh, five, a five-year term. They're, of course, backed by the feed-in tariff programs. We have 20-year contracts to sell all the electricity we generate. They're secured by mortgages on title that we place on every project we do. And when you join the co-op, you get uh, one vote in it. And it doesn't matter if you have 60% of the total investments, you get one vote. It's a very democratic form of process. We have a number of other organizations who have uh, joined in. Bullfrog Power has invested a quarter million dollars. Uh, they are downstairs. Uh, by the way, they have a booth, uh, I believe. So. There's someone that you should check out. Also worth checking out is ZooShare, uh, which is another cooperative like us who's planning to make clean renewable energy from zoo poo and uh, food waste. Very good concept, and uh, we're really hoping that they succeed. We've also had Farmers for Economic Opportunity, Science for Peace, Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment. Uh, they've invested, uh, they've added to their investment twice more now. I don't know what they're up to. And uh, Canadian uh, 
uh, Association of Naturopathic Doctors. We have three more that we're going to be announcing within the next five weeks. Some of them are very big names that you'll know. What we do when we build the project is we have a private lenders group, uh, myself, uh, three of my fellow board members, and um, six outside, or sort of five outside individuals and the Bullfrog who put our private capital to cover the construction risk of actually building the projects. Because if there's ever a risk with the project, it's just making sure that it's going to get built and, and, and generate. So we cover that part of it so that the bondholders are not exposed to that risk. When the project is up and running and generating, we then refinance it. And we refinance that by 30% from the solar bonds, and then we take a long-term debt, 15 or 17 year at a fixed rate, so that we know what our cost, we, we very much control what our interest costs are on that. The reason we don't go more than 30% for public bonds is that with five-year bonds, when we go to renew them, what happens if you know the 5% that's satisfactory today because of market interest rates jumping, what happens if it's 10 or 12% that's required to be viable? Well, we, we would need to meet that. We need to keep down the portion of our project so that we have a limited impact on ourselves, and this has all been thought out. There are three groups of risks that we frequently uh, talk about because risks are always something that you should consider, obviously, when you, when, you, uh, when you look at these things. The first is the asset and operational risks, or in other words, will the project be built, uh, built to a good quality standard and built on time? We do extensive project due diligence. Uh, we have a long uh, five-page technical specification which determines how the project will be designed, built, and operated. Uh, we're very conservative in our output modeling and we engage engineers with the most sophisticated modeling tools to, to do it. And we use the best in-class components, contractors, engineers, and components. These are all very carefully sourced. Market risks in terms of uh, financing costs, you know, which are an ongoing expense to us. Um, as I mentioned, we negotiate long-term debt to, to, to lock in what our interest rate is to 70% of the value of the projects. Um, we're going to be offering RRSP eligibility on our bonds very soon. In fact, we had, I think the last barrier might have fallen on yesterday afternoon. So it's very, very imminent. Uh, we also uh, have modeled, we assume that we're going to have to uh, renew at higher rates in the future since we're at all time historic lows. The last is the financial and cash flow risks. I mentioned we have 20 year power purchase agreements at fixed prices. Solar has an incredibly predictable cash flows. I mean, from year to year, it typically will only vary about four percent, plus or minus. And a bad year, will typically, bad sun year, will be typically followed by a good sun year. Um, portfolio diversification. Uh, we have uh, we'll have 23 projects as of Monday. 13 more on the hopper. We'll be up to about 28 million dollars with the projects all over the province uh, by the end of the year. Conservative modeling, uh, we have uh, expert uh, maintenance teams, we have a, a contract uh, with the top maintenance firm in Ontario. And uh, the, uh, the nice thing about an investment like this is, if you hear that the, the Canadian dollar has gone up or down, the price of oil has gone up and down, the war has broken out in Russia on the natural gas supply line, the markets have had a meltdown. <laughs> Who cares? It doesn't affect solar share. As long as the sun shines, we're okay. If the sun shop stops shining for a, a, a long period of time, we'll all have bigger things to worry about than our returns. <laughs> um, so I, I personally haven't been invested in it. Um, I, I've had you know, so many people that I know that I've met who have invested and are very pleased with it. Some of our first investors are going to be, their bonds are going to be renewing in about two years. Uh, we're having a real ride. We are doing this because the more investment there is, the more projects we can build, the more we can get in front of groups like this and tell them that solar energy and other renewables are here today, they're viable, and they're the way we should be going in the future. We need a lot more people understanding this and moving forward, and I hope you will join us. Thank you for your time.